Hello, I hope all of you are doing well. It is good to see you tonight, and I hope that your week is going as well as it can be. Uh, we have a big change coming to the Four Lakes congregation this coming Sunday. We're re-adding the second live worship service at 10.30 a.m., uh, most of you will remember that we had two services during the pandemic until the numbers got really bad in Madison last November. And so at that point, we took a two-week pause to go online only. And then when we resumed in-person worship then, we only had the 9 a.m. service that was replayed online then at 1030. And of course, right when the numbers started improving back in middle of November, we were only having 10 or maybe 15 people come to the 9 a.m. service. So it really didn't make sense to split those numbers between two services. But now more of our people have been vaccinated. Our COVID numbers in Madison and Dane County are really outstanding. Things are much better than they were just a few months ago. And we've come really close to our limit of 30 at the 9 a.m. service over the past several weeks. And so we're going back to two services for that reason. Uh, having two services instead of one should also give us more room to spread out. So we're really not expanding anything in that sense, but we're, we're splitting the one service that we have so that we can do a better job spreading out in the room that we have. So I'll be preaching twice again. Uh, we hope to have two different song leaders, if at all possible, and then besides me, the other two elders, John and Aaron, will be at each service to lead the Lord's Supper. So the way that you can help, especially if you're a song leader, uh, would be to get in touch with Silas Morris and let him know that you're willing to lead at one of those two services so we can get back to scheduling that. Over the past few months, I have just been calling uh, random song leaders that I'm pretty sure will be there, and I don't always know that, so it's a, it's a risk, but I usually text them Thursday, Friday, or even Saturday and say, hey, would you be willing to lead singing? So as we get back to two services, that'll be a little bit more difficult to manage. So we'd like to do the scheduling as we used to do with the worship services online. And so again, if you're a song leader and you can help with that, get in touch with Silas and we'll get you back on that schedule and that'll help get us uh, uh, to where we need to be with that. So if you can join us at either 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. this coming Lord's Day morning, this would be a great time to sign up online. If you do not have internet access, if you need any help with the sign-up process, please get in touch either with me or with Kenna. And I uh, thank you so much for your help with this. We had some more visitors this past Sunday, and it was so nice to be able to say, yes, we have room for you. Feel free to, to come along. And so all of you signing up on Sign Up Genius certainly uh, helps with that. As we get started tonight, I wanted to give you a bit of a behind-the-scenes look at what I see every Wednesday when I present this class. As some of you know, I, I think I am on uh, Livestream Pulpit version 3.0 to the best of my knowledge. A few months ago, we upgraded the microphone to a Blue Yeti, and I have it set up on a different stand to try to isolate it from the noise that happens whenever I touch the pulpit or my laptop or if I touch anything. Uh, this thing picks up noise, but with the old microphone, I noticed any time I would touch anything, it would make a little uh, little bit of noise there. And so I have it on a separate stand, isolated with some foam weather stripping uh, on the bottom of it. And then I've got the foam weather stripping underneath the uh, pulpit, kind of laptop holder, whatever you want to call it, to kind of isolate these two from each other. So when I press buttons, it, it doesn't sound like thunder happening or anything like that. Uh, we've learned so much over the past year with all of this stuff going on. And uh, then when we upgraded the microphone, I realized that the sound of me shuffling my notes was almost deafening. And so I've been printing out my notes, laying them up on top of the little pulpit thing there. And so I, I tried turning my notes into a PDF and then sending them to a tablet. And that really helped. So I know sometimes you can see my hand uh, as I kind of slide through or uh, you know swipe through my notes on the on the tablet now um, but I'm using I'm using the the tablet here so it's uh, much quieter than the actual shuffling of the notes I bought the tablet from Vince Alexander a few years ago you may remember Vince and Vince wasn't using it at the time he wanted to sell it and so I bought it not knowing how I might use it I was just kind of curious about a tablet never had one before so now we're using it and we thought of a use for it, thanks to Vince. I would also point out that the tablet is propped up on this little podium thing on a piece of foam from the space shuttle. My uncle Nathan worked for Lockheed Martin, maybe NASA, down in Huntsville. And many years ago, he gave me a scrap of the insulating foam from the space shuttle. And when I started out using the tablet a few weeks ago, I was looking all around the office. I got to prop up this tablet on something. And, and I kind of looked around. And, and when I saw that foam sitting over on a, a shelf to the side, 
I'm like, that is the piece of stuff that I need. And so I've got that little piece of space shuttle foam uh, propping up the tablet. So I thought you may get a kick out of that. I don't know. But um, anyway, thanks to NASA for supporting my tablet for the live stream for tonight's class. It's worked pretty well over the past few weeks. And if you have a history in Madison, you may be interested in knowing that the green light coming down from the ceiling was salvaged from the Mott's Paint Building downtown Madison. I got two of these from Deconstruction over on the east side of Madison, not too far from church, kind of behind the Walmart on the Coosa Trail. There's a like a, a salvage place where they do used building materials that have some kind of historical value a lot of times. And I went down there one time looking for some interesting light fixtures for my office down here. I used to have... Um, Fluorescent fixtures, four tubes each, three of those. So 12 tubes. This place was lit up like daylight when I first built the office and for the next 20 years or so. And those lights developed an awful hum or a buzz. It just driving me nuts. I couldn't study down here. And I'm like, I got to change. So I went down to deconstruction, found these old lights from the Mott's Paint Building. And I repainted them green, the original color. Repainted them, though, on the outside, white on the inside. Put some standard bulbs in there. I love standard bulbs. You can go anywhere and get them. No weird uh, size bulb or whatever. And so I just want to point out that uh, the lights are from Mott's Paint, if uh, any of you have been here in Madison for a long time. Uh, the Mott's Paint building, by the way, is now an upscale hotel, at least part of it, uh, right down on the Isthmus off of East Wash. And I actually checked on staying at that hotel a few years ago for our anniversary, maybe a year or two ago. It's pretty recent. And it was something like $250 per night. And I'm like, nope, <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> but they've done a great job renovating that hotel. But uh, I do have two ceiling fixtures from the old Mott's Paint building. And in the upper right-hand corner of that picture, you can barely see what looks like uh, Casper the Ghost. That's uh, I got two of these light fixtures, kind of 10 inches across, just clamp lights, shop light kind of things with some daylight bulbs in them. Did some research on YouTube on how to light for live stream. And I ended up uh, using clothespins to clothespin two, um, two handkerchiefs over each one to get it a little bit muted to kind of cut down on the shadows and that kind of thing. So anyway, that's the behind the scenes look. I just thought some of you may be interested in that as we get started tonight. I don't think I'd explained any of that for a little while. Uh, tonight we continue with our study of the book of Acts. And as we learned last week, Acts is the book of gospel action, the Acts of the Apostles. Or more accurately, some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, since the book really focuses primarily only on Peter and Paul. Uh, Acts, like Luke, is addressed to a man by the name of Theophilus, and so it seems that both books were written by Luke, the beloved physician. The book of Luke is considered volume one, the life of Jesus, and then the book of Acts is considered uh, volume two, the growth of the early church. By way of review, we have now covered Acts chapter one, and in the ABCs of Acts, you may remember last week, we've learned that A is for ascension. In chapter 1, Jesus ascended back into heaven. We've also seen another apostle appointed as Matthias was chosen to replace Judas. And so the A for chapter 1 could also be apostle appointed. So ascension or apostle appointed, either one of those would be good options for A for chapter 1. I've emailed out the blanks for the ABCs of Acts. I've also mailed hard copies to our members who get the bulletin by old-fashioned snail mail. So if you don't have internet access, most likely I have mailed you the ABCs of Acts a week or two ago. Uh, you may also want to write these in your actual Bible at the beginning of each chapter. If any of you are still using a hardcover or a hard copy Bible, you know, actual paper and ink made out of, you know, dead tree paper kind of thing. Um, a lot of my Bibles I've used through the years as I read through Acts, I kind of add those up there at the chapter heading, the ABCs of Acts. And they've been very helpful to me through the years to help me remember what's in each chapter. And I hope they're helpful to you as well. As we move through the book, if you have any improvements to this list, I am open to suggestions. Uh, please let me know if you can think of something better. And there's several of these that are coming up here pretty quick. C, chapter 3, the one I have, I hate it. I don't like it at all. It's not, I just, I don't like it. And you'll see why when we get to chapter 3. But if you have any improvements to these, I know we have some uh, bright people in the congregation, very creative, and uh, some literary geniuses. And that's what we need for some new and improved, updated ABCs of Acts. And we'll get those out there as we finish our study in a few months. And I get to share those with the world. And I'm not sure what any of you might have found for the letter B in chapter 2. I invited you last week to look ahead and try to think of a B for chapter 2. Uh, but I've always thought of this chapter as being the beginning of the church. 
B, the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. And I wasn't quite sure when to uh, spring this on you tonight, so I thought I'll just get it out of the way here at the beginning. In Acts chapter 2, we see the beginning of the church. So, spoiler alert, it's too late. Uh, no time for the alert. Uh, we're going to see the church begin tonight in Acts chapter 2. We'll only be looking at the first 28 verses or so tonight. So we'll actually study the beginning of the church next week as well. But let's start tonight with Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, one key to understanding this passage is to understand who the they is up in verse number one. Uh, some people suggest that the they in this passage refers to the 120 people who had gathered together in the upper room. However, the general rule is that a pronoun like this refers to the closest noun. And I know uh, we've had a break between chapters 1 and chapter 2, but uh, there were no chapter divisions in the original manuscripts of the Bible. Chapter divisions didn't come along until the mid-1200s A.D. or so. So to figure out who the they in this passage refers to, we go back to the last verse of chapter 1. And if you have a hard copy of the Bible, or if you can scroll back in your device electronically, notice the last verse of chapter 1. Luke says, They drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. And then we go right into chapter 2, where he says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And so the they in verse 1 refers to the twelve apostles. When the twelve apostles had come together in one place, there is this noise like a violent rushing wind, and it fills the house where they're sitting. And this happens to the apostles. It does not happen to the 120 who had gathered together previously. So uh, you'll notice this in some of the commentaries, some of the sermons online, some of the other writing that's been done on this, that the uh, Spirit falls on the 120. It does not. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is limited to the 12 apostles. And we know that uh, by looking at that transition between chapters 1 and 2 and uh, how that they is properly defined. Then with reference to the twelve, something looking like tongues of fire comes down, rest on each one of them. And then these twelve men were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they uh, began speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit is giving them utterance. So the Spirit is telling them what to say. The Spirit is giving them words. Remember, Jesus had predicted this back in John chapters like 15, 16, 17, all in there. He said, this is going to happen. And of course, that was just a few weeks before this. And so this is the fulfillment of that prophecy um, that uh, Jesus made. And this is why defining they is so important here. The Holy Spirit falls only on the 12, not on everybody in the same way. And remember, Jesus had promised this. So back in uh, previously in the middle part of the book of John. And so this is for the 12, not for everybody. In Acts 1, 4, and 5, Jesus gathered the apostles together. If you remember that, just a week or two ago, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's back in the beginning of Acts chapter 1. And so the promise of the baptism of the Spirit is a sign, and we'll see that in just a little bit. The baptism of the Spirit did not save these men. The baptism of the Holy Spirit did not save the apostles. They weren't lost and suddenly become saved here in Acts chapter 2. That's not what is going on here. They are already saved at this point. And so this is different from anything that happens to us today. It's not Holy Spirit baptism that we're still looking for today. That's, that's not what's going on here. Uh, the only other example of anybody else being baptized in the Holy Spirit won't come until Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10. And we'll get to that in a few months. And uh, as with Cornelius, being baptized with the Holy Spirit did not result directly in their salvation. That was not the point of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the same thing we could say is true of the 12 apostles here. But for now, 
Uh, what we need to know is that the Holy Spirit falls on the 12 apostles, not on everybody. We would also point out that this happens on the day of Pentecost. Notice in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come. So by way of history, we need to review that the day of Pentecost was a Jewish holiday. And at the time that, that this was written, at the time this happened, uh, Pentecost was used by the Jews to celebrate the giving of the law of Moses. And supposedly it was on the anniversary of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And it was called Pentecost because it was celebrated 50 days after Passover. And so 50, uh, Pentecost means the 50th. It was also known as the Feast of Weeks, and it was a time when they celebrated the summer wheat harvest. Uh, this is referred to back in Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16, where the law says this, You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. As I said, the word Pentecost goes back to a Greek word meaning 50th, a reference to the 50th day. And I think even as English speakers, many of us can probably look at the word Pentecost and we can see the word five in there, can't we? Pente, as in Pentagon. And so this celebration is one of the feasts where uh, the Jewish people would come in from all over the world to celebrate. They did this several times a year. Jews from every nation would come back to Jerusalem for this one. And that becomes uh, even more significant in the next paragraph. So now that we've looked at Acts 2, 1 through 4, let's continue on with Acts 2, verses 5 through 13. Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 13. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. In verse 5, notice we find that the people are, uh, the people that we're reading about here are described as being devout. And so these people are God-fearing. These are not random heathens off the streets or anything like that. As, as we find here, uh, these devout men are from practically every nation. Uh, they had come together for this feast, and so they are religiously minded. These are a righteous type people, we might say. And we find here that the sound of the violent rushing wind was heard through all the city. In my mind, I'm imagining the sound of a tornado where so many people say it sounded like a freight train, right? That's what everybody says. And of course, if we were to hear that, I think many of us, especially from the Midwest, would, uh, instead of traveling for the basement, what do we do? We head out on the front porch or the back porch and we, we look to see if we can see it. And that's what happens here. There is this noise of this violent rushing wind. And people head out into the streets to figure out where this is coming from. And when this international crowd gathers together, they hear the 12 apostles speaking in their own languages. This is what is known as speaking in tongues. The apostles are not babbling. They're not just speaking nonsense. Uh, but they're, they're not speaking in some... A mysterious unknown language that's not what speaking in tongues really is biblically speaking but they were speaking in the actual languages of the people who had come together and this is clearly miraculous the people realize that these are Galileans and they know this maybe by how they look how they're dressed maybe the accent that they would normally be speaking in uh, these are not scholars who have studied various foreign languages these are not people from those various nations but this is absolutely amazing, and this gets their attention. The apostles 
are speaking in a number of languages. And to me, this is pretty much the opposite of what happens in the Tower of Babel back in Genesis chapter 11. If you remember Genesis chapter 11, there God confused the languages of the people so that they could under not understand each other to kind of uh, prohibit their progress on that tower they were building to heaven very arrogantly. And so he splits them up at that point. But here God almost seems to reverse that curse, uh, at least for a little bit. It's a, it's a sign. It is a practical sign. It's not just meant to wow people. Uh, but this is impressive because it allows the apostles to communicate the best news that the world has, has ever heard. And they're able to do it quickly without taking months out of their schedule to go study these various languages. But they are given this miraculous ability so that they can actually communicate with people. And we'll see that in just a moment. Notice in verses 9 through 11, we have a list of the nations represented kind of by little sections, if we look at it in that way, if we were to look at a map, they are truly from all around the known world at that time, north, south, east, and west. And what's the message? What are they talking about? Well, the apostles are speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That's what's obvious on this day. What might that include? Well, we aren't given specifics here. Luke doesn't tell us, but I'm thinking they are most likely talking about Jesus. And all the amazing things Jesus did over the past three and a half years, the healings, walking on water, raising the dead, casting out demons, and so on, on and on and on. All of those amazing things Jesus did, the mighty acts of God, is what they're talking about here. And the 12 apostles are explaining these things in the native languages of those who had come together, the language of their birth. Um, and at the beginning, the crowd seems to be split in two directions, don't they, as to their reaction. And we see this all through the Bible. People are split in basically two directions. They are asking what that means, so they're interested. They don't have any answers. They want to learn more. But then there are others who are mocking. And notice what they're doing here. They are accusing the apostles of being drunk. And we understand the accusation. If we hear a commotion, if we go out to investigate... And if, you know, my neighbors are gathered around 12 people speaking 12 different languages, and if I don't understand those other languages, and if it's pretty chaotic, what might I assume, especially here in Wisconsin? I might think these people have been drinking. I don't know what's going on here, but it, it doesn't look good, and uh, these people have been drinking. And so this, this gives Peter a chance to respond. This is his open door, so the door cracks open just a little bit. So let's continue then. With this accusation that they've been drinking, let's pick up with Acts 2, verses 14 through 21. Acts 2, Acts 2, verses 14 through 21. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my Spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy." And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In verse 14, notice Peter answers this accusation that the apostles are drunk and Part of his proof is, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, people. It's, it's the third hour of the day. It's 9 a.m. We're not drunk. Uh, by the way, I think this might mean that our 9 a.m. service might be slightly more scriptural than we have been in the past. I'm totally kidding with that. But it, it is interesting to me that the church begins at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. They didn't call it Sunday then. It was the first day of the week, as it is today. But I think we're starting to see that shift from honoring primarily the Sabbath to honoring the first day of the week. Remember, Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. He appeared to a whole bunch of people for the first time on the first day of the week. And then a week later is the next reference that we have to Jesus appearing to people. The next first day of the week 
And here we have the church beginning also on the first day of the week. So 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning is what we're talking about here. Peter goes on to explain that in addition to being too early to be drunk, everything they see happening here is the fulfillment of prophecy. So just a note on the all caps here. What comes next is not shouting. This is not Facebook. This is not Twitter. This is not online where caps mean shouting. Uh, but the New American Standard uses all caps to indicate quotations from the Old Testament. So it's just a formatting issue. Uh, the translation that you're using may do the same. Many modern translations do that to help us make sense of when a, an author is quoting from the Old Testament. It may or may not. I would encourage you to read the principles of translation at the front of the Bible that you regularly use, and that'll tell you a whole lot about what the people translating your translation had in mind when they were doing it and some of those formatting notes. Um, but anyway, just looking at it like this, this tells us, look at the all caps, how many all caps there are. That tells us Peter is basing his message on the Word of God. He's going back to the Hebrew Bible. He's starting where they are. He's starting with a source that they respect. He's starting with the Word of God, and he's basing his message on the Word. He's inspired. He is an apostle. He is full of the Holy Spirit. He's just been baptized with the Spirit, and yet he's basing his message on Scripture. And if Peter, an inspired man himself, bases a sermon on Scripture, uh, how much more important is it for us to base our studies and our sermons on Scripture as well? Uh, specifically, he explains that what they're seeing is the fulfillment of prophecy. In verse 16, this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. It doesn't get any clearer than that. This is what was spoken of. Uh, some of the other older translations may say, this is that. You know, this is what they were talking about. It is being fulfilled right here today in your presence. And when we check the cross-reference, as many of our Bibles will have, usually a little... Uh, lowercase letter leading over to something at the bottom or in a column somewhere, uh, you may note that it comes from Joel chapter 2. And so Peter starts this sermon with a direct quote from Joel chapter 2. And this reminds me of something I learned many years ago, um, perhaps from Brett Rutherford. Some of you remember Brett used to preach in Madison from 1997 until early 2000. And I think it was Brett, I'm not, a, I'm not positive, I think it was, uh, he used to explain that Joel 2, Isaiah 2, and Daniel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts 2. And that made a lot of sense to me. It just I'd never thought about that before. And I'd been preaching for a number of years by the time I met Brett. But uh, Joel 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So we've got the reference here to Joel 2. In Isaiah 2, we have Isaiah saying, Now what will come about in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised up above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Just a quick note on that. Isaiah was predicting that these things would happen in the last days. That these things would happen in the last days. A reference to what we would refer to as the Christian age, spanning from the cross until the Lord returns for us. So we're in the last days right now, and we have been ever since the cross. Now that's why the author of Hebrews starts his book by saying, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. So I know a lot of people today will say, oh, look at the world, look at the, look at the virus, look at the bad stuff happening. We're in the last days. Well, we've been in the last days for the past 2,000 years, haven't we? Because the author of Hebrews says, in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son. So we've been in the last days uh, and, and have been ever since the death of Jesus. The prophecy in Daniel 2 is also fulfilled here in Acts 2. And I'm just, I'm going back to that statement again that I think was Brad who taught me that. But uh, Isaiah 2, uh, Daniel 2, and Joel 2. Um, remember, uh, with reference to the Roman Empire, Daniel says in Daniel 2.44, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. 
and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. So God's eternal kingdom is being established right here in Acts chapter 2. So Joel 2, Isaiah 2, and Daniel 2 are all fulfilled here in Acts chapter 2. Feel free to look up those references, but uh, that's a, a good thing to remember. Joel 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, all fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So to explain what the people are seeing, uh, Peter says that what you're seeing right now is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. So before we get into what Joel actually said, whatever these next verses mean, I think we can agree that they are being fulfilled right at the moment Peter is speaking these words. Okay, so I mean, he says, this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. So what you are seeing here today is the fulfillment of the following. And then he reads this quote from Joel chapter 2. Now, some of this then is obviously symbolic. Uh, as far as I know, we have no record of the moon literally turning to blood, for example. Uh, but that kind of language was sometimes used to refer symbolically to hugely significant events. What we need to know about this passage is that these passages Peter quotes here are being fulfilled at that very moment. In other words, what's going on right here is changing the course of world history. Some have suggested a possible literal fulfillment of the sun turned into darkness with the darkness of the crucifixion. Okay, that's possible, that, but that doesn't seem to explain all of this in some literal way. So I'm, I'm definitely open to some symbolic uh, figurative type language going on here. But we know it was fulfilled uh, right around the time Peter is saying this. These, you people have seen these things that Joel was prophesying. Sometimes, by the way, the prophets would use similar language to describe the fall of powerful nations, to describe transitions between kingdoms as one kingdom is overthrown and another another kingdom takes over. Uh, with reference to the coming fall of Babylon, for example, this is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 13.10. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Well, when Babylon fell, stars uh, did not literally go dark. But Babylon falling was such a huge change in world history. Nobody could imagine the world without the Babylonian Empire, a world superpower. And so Isaiah uses figurative language to describe it. And that seems to be what's happening here, as Joel uses figurative language to describe the coming of the Lord's kingdom, a major shift in world history. At the end of this paragraph, in verse 21, uh, Peter continues quoting from Joel, and he says, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I know many people would love it if Acts 2 could have just ended right here. We call on the Lord's name, and we're saved. The end. Move on to Acts chapter 3. However, Peter's just getting started with what he has to say here, and we dare not end here if Peter doesn't end here. So we can't leave it at that. Just call on the Lord and you'll be saved. We can't end there because he doesn't end there. He keeps going. The problem is, if we call on the Lord to be saved by speaking to him, these people have just killed the Lord. And so they've just murdered their only hope of salvation. So if we take that in a literal sense, that they are to call out to the Lord for salvation, well, what Peter's getting to is, you just murdered him. You murdered the man you're supposed to be calling out to. And so Peter will need to continue this line of reasoning to explain what Joel meant when he first said that. So this sermon is not over yet. I think we just need to understand that. We need to keep listening for everything that Peter says, not just part of it. We can't be selective in our hearing here. Also, if we say that just calling on the name of the Lord with our lips saying, Lord save me, or something like that, if we say that that's all that we need to do, just saying something like, Lord help me, or Lord save me, then it seems that we're contradicting what Jesus actually said in Matthew 7, 21, when he specifically said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. 
And so salvation obviously requires more than just saying, Lord, save me. Jesus himself said as much and specifically tells us that mere words are not enough. Plus, we have further commentary on this from Paul himself. Later in the book of Acts, in Acts 22, 16, as he relates what he was told to do by Ananias, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. In other words, being baptized is how we call on his name. It's not a matter of just saying, Dear Lord, please save me, and then we're in. That's not, that's not what Paul was told. That's not what Ananias said. That's not what Paul understood. Uh, this is affirmed by Peter in 1 Peter 3.21. When he says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism saves us, as baptism is the appeal to God for a good conscience. Baptism is how we call on God for salvation. And we'll get back to that a little bit later in Acts chapter 2, hopefully next week. So let's continue with one more paragraph before we pause before next week. So one last section tonight will be Acts 2, verses 22 through 28. Acts 2, 22 through 28. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted, Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter now ties those words from Joel to Jesus. So this is the application of the lesson. Jesus truly is the key to all of this. So first of all, this is what the Bible says, kind of point one in his sermon. Now, this is what it means for all of you standing here today. And this is where he introduces Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus from the village of Nazareth. I find it interesting. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wasn't he? But he doesn't introduce Jesus as Jesus the Bethlehemite, but he introduces him as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was attested to them by God through miracles and wonders and signs. This is the purpose of miracles, by the way to show that somebody really is from God or speaking on God's behalf. And Peter's point here is, you know this. This is not a secret. Nobody can deny this. Everybody in Jerusalem, everybody hearing these words, we all know about Jesus and we all know the amazing things that he did. This has been a perfect time for somebody to stand up and say, no, he didn't. And yet that's not what happened here, is it? Because they all know it. Peter continues and uh, notice that Jesus was clearly from God even though God knew that it would happen, these people actually did it. So God, God's foreknowledge is different from him causing something to happen. These people nailed Jesus to a cross by the hands of godless men. They put him to death. So if I could summarize, you killed Jesus. You, gathered here today, you killed the Son of God. And note, these people standing there didn't actually drive the nails. But Peter says that they did it through the hands of godless men. A couple ways of taking that. Most people would think that's uh, saying the Romans did it. They are the godless men. And I think that's the number one, that, that's what I come away with. Um, I noticed one of the commentaries was saying that that could be a reference to their own leaders, that they are the godless men. They are lawless men. They ignored even the law of Moses in the trial of Jesus and putting him to death. But either way, I think we understand um, that they didn't have to be personally the ones holding the spikes and the hammer in order to be guilty of this. Um, the Roman government, from all outward appearances, crucified Jesus. But remember, Pilate had declared him innocent. The Roman centurion, who managed the whole process, declared Jesus innocent after it was all over. And so Peter says, you, all of you gathered here today, you are responsible for murdering the Son of God. Peter continues, though, by explaining that God raised him up. And again, this is 
common knowledge in Jerusalem at this point. You can't argue against this. Uh, it happened only seven weeks before this. Uh, this, by the way, would have been the perfect opportunity, again, for somebody to speak up to contradict this. Oh, yeah, that's what you think. Let me show you his body. I stole the body and stuffed it over here somewhere. But nobody could do that because that's not what actually happened. Um, everybody knew that Jesus was crucified, that he was buried, that he had come back from the dead, that that could not be denied. Uh, remember, even the chief priests knew that this happened. They heard it straight from the soldiers. They had eyewitness testimony from the soldiers who were there. And they bribed the soldiers to be quiet about it. So everybody knows. Nobody can deny this. And nobody interrupts at this point, as they will later on another issue. Uh, but nobody interrupts here, as they very easily could have done if they had had contrary information. Uh, starting in verse 25, Peter starts quoting David. And if you look at the footnote there, this is from Psalm 16. In the prophecy from Psalm 16, David speaks of Jesus. And in this prophecy concerning Jesus, the text says that God will not abandon his soul to Hades, nor allow his Holy One to undergo decay. I think we just need to understand here, Hades was considered to be the, uh, the place of the dead. It wasn't good or bad. It was basically just a reference to death or the place that dead people go. So God would not leave the Lord Jesus in Hades. He would not allow his body to decay. And we know where Peter's going with this, don't we? Um, and I don't know if we caught this, but Peter is preaching the gospel here, isn't he? The good news. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul defines the good news as being the news about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's what Peter just outlines here. You nailed Jesus to a cross, but God lifted him up. This is the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection in a nutshell. So Peter is preaching the gospel. He's preaching the good news. I hate to do this, but uh, this is where we need to pause for tonight. I see we're about 40 minutes in. Uh, there is no way to cover all of Acts 2 in one night. And so let's remember this and let's pick up here next week if the Lord will. So next week we'll pick up with Acts 2 verse 29. Uh, also, if you haven't done it already, even if you have, uh, try to either read through or listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, if at all possible. And I think it'll help us understand what's going on in the whole book. It takes about two hours and 15 or 20 minutes or so to read through all, uh, all 28 chapters. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. This is an important book, uh, the history of the church. This is all about us. And I hope to see you on Sunday, either at 9 o'clock or at 1030. And this would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help with that process. Uh, let me know if you need, if you have something we need to be praying about. If there's some way that we can serve you as a congregation, please uh, give me a call. For those of you joining us on the phone, my number at church, the church number is 608 224 0274 608-224-0274 and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we are in awe of your plan for your kingdom, the church. Tonight we've seen prophecies made and prophecies fulfilled and we've seen Peter, a changed man, stand up to preach the good news just a few weeks after doing the exact opposite. Thank you for the change that your son's resurrection makes in our lives. We pray that we would have the courage to tell people about the good news. Tonight, we're thankful for our Christian family here in Madison. We pray for those who are struggling through various challenges, sickness, unemployment, loneliness, grief, depression, the cares of this life, serious medical challenges. We pray that we would find comfort and support in your kingdom, the church, through your people, our people our Christian family. We pray that we would always do good and share, for we know that with these sacrifices you are truly pleased. We pray that we would always be a light in this dark world. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.